Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of what I like to call the advice industry. This is a look at a lot of the sources that we as people and professionals get on advice for both our professional and personal lives. And I take a specifically a bit of a critical look there, not because I don't think there's good advice out there. I think I would like to think that I offer some advice of merit myself, but because there's a lot of promotion in the industry and I think it's important to differentiate some of the style from the substance to help make you a better consumer of those areas. And I will say that the advice industry as I define it is pretty broadly defined. It includes everything from such as myself, hired speakers, business authors, management gurus, the media. I also get into business schools and academics, even the advice that you might get from your friends and neighbors. And I usually conclude with a look inward to us as an audience and ask why it is that we might be so receptive to some of these messages. Now, I will say I take a deliberately skeptical view. That's not to, uh, that's not to say that I won't acknowledge throughout the presentation what the merit is, but I think that you will get a lot of promotion about the positives from the areas of, uh, areas of advice themselves. And so I think uh, we're a little bit one-sided here in terms of taking a critical look. That's not something you get elsewhere. So it will skew a little bit negative. That's not meant to be dismissive. It's just meant to be a little irreverent. And for that reason, it's actually a good presentation if you are trying to strike a right balance at your organization or event on a speech that, that is substantive enough to be informative, but not so serious or specific to a functional area that it becomes heavier weighted down. So if you've had a conference that covers a lot of very detailed topics of your particular field and you'd like to balance it out with something a little bit lighter but still not being frivolous or strictly entertainment something that'll be informative I think it's a really a, a really hits a sweet spot so with that in mind let's talk a little bit about some of the examples for my sample I'd like to start out with hired speakers I do this in fairness since uh, I'm, I'm the critic here I, I should start out with myself for the sake of uh, balance um, one of the dangers that you have in, in terms of hiring speakers is a lot of speakers select into speaking as a profession because they appreciate the showmanship of it. Now that's not to say that they can't be substantive and a good showman, as, as a matter of fact that's probably the best balance, but oftentimes they compensate, uh, they, they, they are drawn to the showmanship first and the content is a, a little bit lacking. And when I say selected here, I don't necessarily mean you as an audience selecting them as a speaker, I mean more self-selecting. And you can end up in a situation where, uh, I've seen this happen for some presenters, they, they will tell you about a story uh, uh, from their personal experience about how they were faced with a daunting challenge and they persevered over it and, and overcame or how they were faced with a complicated problem and they uh, were man managed to have a really clever solution for it. And then they always conclude with the example of, and so I think that might help you in your challenging situation. And what you can quickly realize is they, they, what they really like is getting on stage and talking about how amazing their accomplishments are. They're really clever or they really overcame something. And the sort of, and so I tell that to you because it might apply to you too, is kind of an afterthought. Really, this was all a pretext for their own sort of narcissistic indulgence. I also wanted to talk a little bit about motivational speakers specifically as a subset of hired speakers. Now, I do believe that there is value in motivational speaking. Specifically, if you're on a retreat, if you're in an area, especially like Salesforce, this, uh, this is oftentimes very applicable to a Salesforce because uh, that's a difficult job. It involves a lot of rejection and it's, it's good to recharge your batteries. And also, there is such a thing as genuine inspiration. I mean, sometimes we have a book that might inspire us. We have a story that inspires us, a film that inspires us, and there's no reason a speaker can't do the same, that they can't re recount that story. The qualifier I want to put on that is that oftentimes that's a very one-sided view. Motivational speaking is specifically helpful to people who have potential but are unrealizing it. And it is, it is helpful to help them uh, recognize that potential and perhaps energize them to pursue it. But that's a very specific subset. And I, I say that's a bit one-sided because oftentimes if you've ever seen the first episode of a new season of American Idol, that sort of you can do it anything possible attitude is not really applicable. Some of those people really 
are in over their head. They're not going to pursue their dream of being a rock star, and it might be more helpful for them to do something else. To, to, not that they're not valued as a person, but they should find something that's a better fit for their, what, what they're offering. And sometimes I get criti criticism from this. People might say, well, hey, you know, they're saying they're, it's a positive message. What could possibly be wrong with that? And my response is a positive message that encourages someone to pursue something that is exceedingly unlikely to succeed is not only just a failure to be positive, it's actually harmful. I mean, these people don't need to be told that they're going to be rock stars. And so that's something that I think you should sort of bear in mind as you're picking a motivational speaker. And also, if you have an event, it, you might question whether motivational speaking is the right fit for that group. Like I said, if you're recharging batteries, if you want to sort of provoke some creative thought, that might be very helpful. But if you're trying to, if it's a career guidance and you're trying to get people to find the right fit, an explicitly motivational indulge what you personally like might not be the most helpful. Secondly, I, I talk about academics, sort of the opposite extreme. This tends to be very substantive. The academic careers, to have a, a professor, for example, in an area of expert who did some research on an area, come and speak at your event, that, that generally gets you very substantive. A lot of them are uh, typically very research-based. But if you look at the way academic careers work, they tend to be uh, rewarded for being the, having the greatest depth in the most narrow field. And so there you can run the risk of having a speaker whose speech is too narrow in focus and specific to their thesis or whatever their last research was. And as a result, you're not going to get a broad applicability. And, you, and so if you're going to look for an academic speaker, it's best if you have a very narrow audience. You're, and by that I mean they're all from the same field. If you have a broad-based audience, that might not necessarily be the direction you want to go. A nice balance between these two extremes might be the experienced business professional, but oftentimes you'll find that successful business leaders are either too busy running their businesses or they've retired to West Palm Beach and they don't really want to fly to Cleveland in January to give a lecture to people. So they're oftentimes, sometimes the, the most valuable people are the most difficult to get. Um, I also wanted to talk about the halo effect. And by that, I mean oftentimes, sort of as I sp spoke earlier, there's a strong impulse for showmanship in a lot of the speaking industry. And that's great. It keeps the audience engaged. It can keep the energy up. But it's important to notice when the entertainment is becoming a substitute for the information. And oftentimes, the halo effect of a person who's really engaging, they can end up being uh, not terribly informative. They'll, they'll use certain tricks, like they'll, they'll give you catchy phrases like, uh, I don't believe in the impossible, I believe in the and possible. And while that certainly sounds slick, I, I don't really know what I'm going to do tomorrow morning differently because of that. And they also like to get the audience engaged by asking the sort of obvious questions like, hey, let's see a show of hands. How many people here want to be successful? And, and uh, so there are a lot of sort of tricks of the trade that will get the audience engaged, but aren't necessarily giving you very actionable information. And even if they are informing you, you ought to remember is that the, uh, even if they're providing I insight, the question becomes, is that a good use of your time? I've seen people give hour-long presentations on a very valid subject, and they had an insight or a couple of insights. But if you look at it, did I really learn, did I really need all of those examples from an entire hour? You're not getting a good insight per unit of time. And oftentimes the academics can easily f fall into that trap because their insights are narrow and you might be able to get all that they, they have to offer you as a generalist in a few minutes and it ends up taking a lot longer than that. And it's important to remember that when you're talking about speakers, time is the main currency that you're worried about. Even more than speaker fees, as I, I think that you guys should be willing to pay us whatever we, we ask, but when it comes to speaker fees, the real cost is not the cost of the venue or even the speaker. The cost is in the time. If you have an audience of 100 people and you figure out what they're worth per, how much they get paid per hour, and then you take a half hour or an hour of their time, you realize that that's actually the dominant effect when you choose a speaker. So let's talk a little bit. Let's wrap up speakers and move on to my next example for my sample here. That's the business authors, the business or management gurus. There are several perverse incentives that I am concerned about in this field. And the first one is there is an incentive to exaggerate the applicability of what they do. If you think about it from the perspective of someone selling a book, what their incentive is, is to make this book appeal to as broad set a group as possible. And so oftentimes they exaggerate the applicability. They have the one tool and they say that this will be the solution to all of your organization's problems. And you need to think very critically 
about, and, and it's easy to make the mistake of if you find that a valuable tool, you will then extrapolate that to see, therefore, we need, that's what we need. And the reality is there are a lot of valuable tools and a lot of genuine insights they provide that might not be the problem that your organization is faced with. So, so it's important to think critically about that. And there are a couple of problems that you face with them. One of them is uh, there's an old expression, when you're carrying a hammer, everything in the world starts to look like a nail. That's the exaggeration of applicability. They think that their solution solves everything. And the second one is my next point, and that is oftentimes uh, they might have a limited experience or a specific experience, and they draw the assumption that what worked for them is what will work for you. For example, sometimes they might be in an industry that's vastly different than your own, and so if their experience is specific to that industry, that might be their entire worldview, whereas it fails to apply to your uh, your particular company, organization, or industry. And the next thing I usually bring up is that there's a, there's a big difference between comprehensiveness and an original contribution. So for example, let's say you're talking about marketing. A person who is giving you a comprehensive view on marketing is like a person who would write a textbook. It will try and incorporate all of the information on that subject to make you an expert. However, authors, and this is genuinely uh, done for a good reason, they might skip over the comprehensiveness because they, ha they want to only include their original contribution. And that makes sense from their perspective. They don't need to reinvent the wheel. They only want to write a book on what they themselves have an area to make an original contribution in. The problem is, if you are not an expert in this field, then the original contribution comes away being your entire worldview of that subject. I oftentimes uh, uh, end up in a situation where I meet someone who, in, who will uh, read a book on marketing, whatever one book they read last quarter, last year, all of a sudden they think is the defining book on, uh, on marketing itself. And, and the reality is that was really driven by uh, a, a very narrow set of a comprehensive subject. And by the way, this isn't necessarily to fault the authors themselves, it's just important something to bear in mind as you select who you want to read or listen to. And then the last one I want to talk about here is the one trick ponies. This is where you have a business author or a business guru and they make an entire career out of one insight or one observation. And they have an incentive to continue to iterate off of that insight rather than go off and generate something new. Uh, a good example of this is if you look at something like the uh, Clayton Christensen, uh, The Innovator's Dilemma. What was his next book? The Innovator's Solution. Or if you look at uh, Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, his next book was The Eighth Habit. Or if you look at uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul, all of a sudden you have Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul, and then you have Chicken Soup for something else. And I'm literally not making this up. There is a chicken soup for the scrapbooker's soul. So they, they, can, uh, they can proliferate out and they might become less valuable uh, with each iteration. And this is sort of a problem that the film actors always complain about. Everybody wants me to do a sequel of my last movie rather than do something more creatively original. Now for the record, I'm not necessarily criticizing the authors for this. Uh, for example, Clayton Christensen, Stephen Covey, I think those guys provide a lot of insight. But um, there is an incentive in the industry to sort of push them in that direction. Now it might be that they only had one good idea, but I think most of people, like, like some of the ones I mentioned, um, really have something valuable to say. So that's a little bit of a sample on my business authors, management gurus. Let's talk a little bit about a media group, uh, a media instance, and I'm using specific, what I call here irreverently, the rich guy interviews. So you go on CNBC and they're doing a special on this billionaire or this entrepreneur, and they generally hold these people up as role models. And that is not necessarily unhealthy, but I think it's important to qualify some of the reasons that that might not be uh, uh, something to take holistically, wholeheartedly. You might want to qualify that a bit more. And the first point I want to make on that is what I call selectivity bias. So for example, let's say there is a job that is very lucrative, but has an unlikely likelihood, uh, is unlikely to have any individual succeed in. A classic example of this is the music industry. It's very difficult to become a popular singer, but the ones who do, to them, it was successful. So they write songs about following your dreams and making anything possible. And the reality is that you're only hearing from the 1% who made it, not the 99 who didn't. And that has a selectivity bias. You are only getting a, a very narrow set. And in fact, if you are a young person thinking of pursuing a career, you would be best to listen to a more rounded group of people than the, just the successful. And that goes for business people as well. Oftentimes the entrepreneur, the serial entrepreneur, they only interview the one who made it. 
They, then they tell their story about how, look, I, my credit cards were maxed out and I was down to my last dollar and I was about to have to sell my car and then I hit it big. They never interview the guy who was maxing out his credit cards and down to his last dollar and was about to sell his car and then his product flopped and he had to go get a job as a waiter. So there's a lot of uh, uh, biases in that. I, a good example of this is Mark Cuban in his book. He said, anyone can do, if I can do it, anyone can do it. To which I would respond, that might be true, but if anyone can do it, doesn't necessarily imply that everyone can do it. And that's a failure to acknowledge the risk. The last one I want to talk about is luck versus skill. Un under this subset, under this heading is luck versus skill. That's a very common uh, expression to hear stated as, uh, I'd rather be lucky than good. But if you listen to the people as, who get interviewed on television, and this is a natural human reaction, we'd like to think that we're there because of something we did, that it's our skill and our success, and we fail to differentiate the important role that luck played. And of course, luck is not necessarily repeatable and is not advisable to other people. The next one I want to talk about is what I call cooperation bias. Now this is something inherent in the media, and that is this. When you go in to have an interview with a news agency or a particular reporter, they have a bias to be as cooperative, they're, they're, they're sort of torn uh, by loyalties. On the one hand, they want to be critical and give the audience uh, a well-balanced perspective, but if they are too critical, you won't come on their show anymore. And so uh, there's always a subtle conflict of interest among the people make, uh, asking the questions and giving the interviews. This is particularly pronounced in the business world because the other area that you oftentimes see interviewed on TV is usually politicians. But here in the West, basically all of our politicians are elected, and so they kind of have to go on and, and speak to the public. They have to get their face out there, get themselves in front of the voter. Business people don't always have to do that. And so you might find that the business networks give a much, more, a much softer, if you will, interview. Let's talk a little bit about the, the next one, which is uh, personality disorders. If you look at the people who are drawn to excel in business as well as any industry, that oftentimes requires a high level of personal drive. Now in general, and especially in these interviews, we consider that a positive trait that we, that we ascribe to role models and we try and emulate it. But there are a couple of things with that. First of all, sometimes that is a personality characteristic that we can't emulate. We don't have that kind of energy, that kind of drive. We like to sleep more than four hours uh, a night. And so to apply that, to hold them up as the people we should aspire to be like is not really effective to us because that's just something that it's, it's deep within us, it's innate, and we can't necessarily change that. It's sort of a waste of time to consider that uh, uh, something to aspire to. The second thing is, it's, it's always been interesting to me that obsessiveness is generally a trait that we consider a problem in young people. If you have a child and all he wants to do is read about Star Trek and he goes to school, he reads about Star Trek before he goes to school and he comes home and reads more about Star Trek and then he wants to watch Star Trek movies, you would be concerned. You would say, get out there, grab a bat and ball, go make some friends, go play. Whereas the 33-year-old lawyer at the law firm who does nothing but work on his uh, legal work all day, that's a go-getter. All of a sudden that becomes a positive trait. And it's important to remember that that can throw your life out of balance. And if you look at a lot of the uh, rich guys that do get interviewed, you'll find out that they, they are wealthy, but they oftentimes are on their third wife and all of their children have a di uh, dysfunctional relationship with their children. And it's important to question whether or not that's really something you would want to have. Uh, essentially, the rich guy interviews tend to prioritize some of the more vulgar things like money and power, and they select them based on those criteria rather than on who is the most well-rounded. Uh, the last thing I want to mention about personality disorders is, you know, business is all about risk and reward, and sometimes that creates a, an unfortunate dilemma where you, uh, while many people are attracted to business because they're very analytical and they want to go somewhere where they can make a contribution to their, their society that way, they want to be compensated for that skill, but because of the risk reward, it can also attract people who have a certain tendency towards gambling. They really like the, the uh, they, they really like assuming the risk and this is a socially acceptable way of indulging in that trait. And that's always a, a particularly dangerous to recognize in your role models and it's especially dangerous if these are the people who are working for you or managing your money because they will oftentimes, if they're, if they're doing this, running your business this way, they're effectively gambling with your money and they might take some, some uh, poorly gauged risks uh, accordingly. Um, and then 
uh, I wanted to broach the point of how oftentimes when you see these interviews with uh, someone who's wealthy or successful in a certain industry, they will oftentimes ask them about other areas, sometimes not even pertaining to business. And these get progressively more and more ridiculous. Asking a business person what they think about business makes sense. Asking a business person who they're voting for for president is a little bit more debatable. And then oftentimes they'll end up asking them about society and culture or what should we do with the war in Afghanistan and you'll feel uh, it, sometimes it gets quite ridiculous. There's a long history of this. Once Henry Ford uh, invented the assembly line and made his money that way, he, they started asking him about all kinds of political questions and realized he's not actually a very worldly guy. He's just very smart about figuring out how to put a car together cheaply. And uh, he, he ended up going down some political paths that uh, the, the Ford company and family would probably rather forget. I'll let you look that up on your own. And the last thing I want to talk about is the same thing we talked about over here with speakers. Oftentimes, the, the people who want to be interviewed on television are the ones who are particularly prone towards this element of showmanship. And as I like to say, showmanship is imperfectly correlated towards responsible stewardship of shareholder value. That's, a, that's a specifically a business phrase. But some people might even argue showmanship is negatively correlated to uh, responsible stewardship of shareholder value. By that, the people who are the biggest, by that, in short, I mean the biggest show offs oftentimes aren't the most responsible managers. And I always use the example, uh, you know, a lot of times they like to, they want to be known as a maverick and an innovator in their field, and so they'll, they'll get pictured on the, the cover of a magazine doing something exciting. And I always say, if the CEO of the company is pictured on the cover of a magazine on their Harley, and they are not the CEO of Harley, short the stock. Now that's not to say, again, not to say that there's no value in this. Obviously, if they're successful, there might be something in there. Um, even when it comes to showmanship, I think Warren Buffett is as happy as anyone to get his face on television. He likes to have his ideas heard, but I think he actually gives very valuable advice, very conservative, responsible advice. So anyway, that's a quick primer on the advice industry. Hopefully you found this of interest, and I look forward to doing business with you.